Good morning, everyone. It's time to go on the record. Major upgrades to the MBTA, new green line cars, but old problems still cropping up. Steve Poptak takes control as general manager, the challenge of keeping this vital system on the rails. On the tee, new general manager, same old problems, we ask. At a time when cities must lead, look to Boston, the leader of cities. Boston's Mayor Marty Walsh with a message for Washington. Start leading or step aside. Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Very good morning to you, everyone. And our guest this morning is Steve Poftak on the record. He's recently appointed as the new general manager of the MBTA. He is the fifth person to hold that job under the administration of Governor Charlie Baker before his promotion. Mr. Poftak was the vice chair of the MBTA Fiscal and Management Control Board. He's also served in the state's Executive Office for Administration and Finance. He is a resident of Austin, a graduate of Millbury College, and he received an MBA from Babson College. And do you take the T to work? Yes, I do. Yes, he does. He takes yes. the T to work. But you said that you sometimes take the commuter rail just to get a sense I'm, uh, of how things work. I'm lucky working. enough to be able to get the commuter rail as well as the bus and subway gets me so to work. So he's a user so of both. the system. Yes. So, which leads us to our first question. I, you're just settling into the job, but. You've had good news, you've had bad news. For example, the green line is um, the new cars, terrific, I've been on them. Great, you know, great uh, addition to this fleet. Um, you've also, the commuter rail is doing pretty well. It's yeah. um, got a huge, much lo a larger growth of ridership than anything else. And um, it's had its best on time of performance in four and a half years. But there's also some problems with the orange line, for example, the cars, which probably the folks that needed the, the system the most use the orange line delays in the new cars arriving what happened sure uh, there's a brief delay while we uh, we're in the process of accepting the cars they have to go through a third party certification process um, we've we're, we've had a several month delay on that we're working hard to make sure that the production schedule stays on track so that all the cars are in place by the end of 2022 um, you know these cars should last 37 years I want to make sure that we accept them in a way that they're going to be reliable and we're going to be able to get the full life out of those cars. So I'm willing to tolerate um, a couple months delay, but we're also still continuing to do f uh, pr production full speed ahead on those cars. So um, once again, when is the date that the new cars will be put on the line? Uh, we're hopeful. Uh, we're hopeful at some point this spring. We have to wait for this third-party certification process to play itself out. And what about the Blue Line extension to Lynn? There's been lots of talk about it, and I think there's m even more buzz about it on Beacon Hill right now. Is that a possibility at all? There is a there's a long-term planning process right now underway um, called Focus 40 that is uh, that's taking a look at all these projects. So we're waiting to see sort of how that process plays out mm -hmm. about which you know which projects might be coming over the horizon. Mm -hmm. are you, when you say Focus 40, you're talking about 40 years down the road or, or the next 40 projects you want to do? It's Where Focus 40. It's the next 40 years down right. the road. All right. I, I want to talk about the, the red line commuters and, and specifically about the about the Alewife garage. We did many stories here with Five Investigates showing how, how it had completely just fallen apart. So what's the long-term prospect for the ailing structure and what other critical infrastructure issues are looming that you've discovered so far? Sure. Um, you know, the, the garage was obviously in bad shape. The team moved very quickly to make emergency repairs. We are also in the process of doing long-term repairs over the next year. We're going to assess the garage after that mm -hmm. um, and sort of come up with a long-term plan for what do we do with that structure? How best do we serve those commuters? Um, and we're also working to put a management regime in place which puts uh, a single owner in charge of that garage mm -hmm. who can be who can be held accountable for the I, I the understand condition. The, I understand the ripple effect of everything but if you don't have a car in that garage by 730 you're 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 shut out you have to you, that's difficult because obviously a lot of people use it sure and uh, you know we face that right now we face capacity issues at different spots along the commuter rail we've put in place a differential pricing program to try to encourage people to use we've made the underutilized lots cheaper and we've made some of the high utilization lots a little more expensive in hopes, and we're seeing results right now. People are moving to these other lots. Mm -hmm. um, we're serving more people, and the T is actually getting a little additional revenue as well. Do you well. see any consideration to knocking just the garage down and building another one perhaps next to it, or just doing something really drastic to deal with the alloy garage? There, there is going to be a long-term planning process. I, I do want to be clear that we are in the process. When the, all the emergency repairs were made. The garage is safe. Um, we are in the process of doing kind of medium-term repairs to make sure that we have a structure in place for a period of time, and then there will be a long-term planning process 
that will think about what's the best what's the best use of that uh, of that garage space. How best do we serve our customers? So there's more and more concern, not just here in Massachusetts, but uh, about the purchase of so many trains from China. Folks wonder if the software technology embedded in these cars will come back to haunt us someday, as the hacking of sort of intellectual property becomes more common. My question to you: Do you worry about it? And have you been hearing these same questions from other parts of the country as well? Uh, I've, I've, I have not heard it from other parts of the country. We, um, we, all the software going in there meets DOD specs, and um, it's obviously something we'll, you know, we we are mindful of and we'll take a look at. We're very excited to get these cars. We're going to get 404 new cars shortly, um, so we're, uh, you know, we're we're going to work through part of the acceptance process. Will be a rigorous evaluation of the cars. But you're not worried. I'm not worried at all. You know, strangely enough, the three words come into my head: made in America. Not made in China, made in America. Is it, is it just, it's simply as much as a, as a cost effective measure, it's just cheaper to make them in China? These, uh, these vehicles are actually assembled out in Springfield, um, and the, the payment mechanism was set up so that we could direct the company to, to have them assembled in Springfield. So we are employing people assembling in, them in, in, in America. We are assembling them. Um, the, you know, it's very difficult to find an American manufacturer stem to stern of rail cars. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, there's a, you know, there's a, there's a responsibility, there's a fiduciary responsibility to get the, the best prices we can uh, to the taxpayer. So um, to the extent that we can, we can buy American and, and make the right choice um, from a financial point of view, it's surely something we're open to in the future. But this, in this particular transaction, not only were we able to get what I think is a, a very attractive price for these vehicles, but we were also able to create jobs here in Massachusetts to do it. You ready for the OTR pop quiz? I don't know that I'm ever ready. Don't worry about it. Do it's, my only, best. it's only two pages of sheer torture. All right. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. It's much more enjoyable to ride a T-car than it is to take this. All right, you're ready. It's time for the OTR pop quiz. Some MBTA trivia on this Sunday morning. You ready? Here we go. Question Absolutely. one. The Green Line eliminated a branch back in 1969. We have multiple choice on the screen. What branch was it? Was it the A, the G, or the Y branch? It's the A. The A branch is correct. For extra credit, where did the A branch go to, by the way? Do you remember? It is, I believe, the current 7173 bus route up through Cambridge and further out. Back up a little. Well, Watertown is the answer I was looking ah. for. It actually, <laughs> it went through Watertown. That was pretty good. That was though. close that enough. Was that, pretty, was close. that was pretty good. That was close. <laughs> All right. In the Kingston Trio's MTA song, Charlie on the MTA, what station did Charlie's wife visit every day to hand her husband a sandwich as the train came through? And again, it's multiple choice. Was it Kenmore Square? Was it Park Street or was it Scully Square? It was uh, Scully Square, and if you go to the Government Center T-stop now, you will yeah. see the old mural yeah. that continues yeah, to great. say so yeah. Scully right. Square. Yeah. Right. And in fact, also known as Government Center. Yeah. In fact, yes. we're, we're going to go to break, but as we go to break, let's just have a musical reminder of the answer that you just nailed. Listen. Down to the Scully Square station every day at quarter past two, and through the open window she hands Charlie a sandwich as the train comes rumbling through.